So our final vignette uh, is uh, Andrew McAfee on capitalism and the second machine age. I'm not sure, sure Andrew knows this, but the second machine age was the first book we discussed at the New America Book Club, which we launched I think it was this week. It might have been last week. I can't remember at this point. Uh, but uh, we we had a very robust discussion, and as you might expect, uh, with uh, mem many of our own technologists, there was there was a lot of agreement. There was a lot of disagreement. Uh, so Andrew uh, is the associate uh, director of the Center for Digital Business at MIT uh, Sloan School of Management. Uh, and before that, he was a professor at Harvard Business School uh, and a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center. Uh, for internet and society. I think it's fair to say that the second machine age before we got to uh, capitalism in the 21st century has been the book that more people I know have read or have, have read in and are talking about. It really has captured the public imagination. Uh, it, it, uh, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it really demands that you engage with it. Uh, and we're thrilled uh, that Andrew is going to be our final vignette. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. She's too polite to say so, but some of her colleagues informed me that my book got ripped to shreds <laughs> in the New America Foundation book. It's, it's a tough, tough crew. Uh, thank you all for having me here, and thank you all for hanging in so long. We are almost to happy hour. I, I have good news for you. And so to help us get there, I want to talk about a topic that we normally engage in while we've got a good stiff drink in our hands, which is, you know, the, the nature of capitalism. And I want to make... <laughs> okay, if you're a business academic, you spend a lot of time with a good stiff drink talking about the nature of capitalism. And, and I want to make one thing clear at the start. I am a huge fan of capitalism. I believe about it what Winston Churchill believed about democracy, which is that, that it's the worst possible system apart from all the other ones we've tried. But it also feels to me like we're in a little bit of a Charles Dickens world these days where it's simultaneously the best of times and the worst of times. And the best of times have to do with technological progress. And as I look around, the, the, the array and the pace and the speed and the litany of tech progress is absolutely astonishing and kind of overwhelming. We now have planes and cars that can drive themselves very well with complete autonomy. We've got computers now, we've got software systems that can beat any human at chess, at Jeopardy, and I believe pretty soon at medical diagnostics. We've got robots that can do everything from painting a car to milking a cow, and we've got printers that can make a three-dimensional part of any complexity. Um, when I talk to Eric Schmidt and the other alpha geeks of the technology industry, they give me one really clear message, which is, you ain't seen nothing yet. And the stuff that we've seen so far to them, uh, these are not the crowning achievements of this world that we're creating. These are the warm-up acts. And the kinds of innovation that we're going to see over the next decade are, are just going to leave a, just blow us away with what's going on. I don't think we're heading into a science fiction world. I think we're heading into a world that leaves science fiction behind. Keep in mind, George Jetson drove his vehicle to work. <laughs> so that's, these are the best of times. And it honestly, I think it is the best economic, economic news on the planet these days for a very simple reason. Tech progress is one of the foundations of productivity growth. And productivity growth is one of the foundations of affluence. It's how we get better off as an economy, as a society over time. So it's absolutely the best economic news on the planet. But if any of us have been looking around at a lot of the data these days, we realize that while tech progress might be absolutely necessary, it's clearly not sufficient because some of the trends that we're seeing are distressing. They're heading in the wrong direction. And they're contributing to this impression that these are actually the worst of times in some ways. The, the large, the historically large, stable, and prosperous American middle class, which honestly has been one of the crown jewels of what we've come up with as a country, is getting hollowed out. And this process has been going on exactly as we've been getting into a more and more technologically advanced society. Median income for the American family right now is lower than it was 15 years ago. And job growth is, at best, 
keeping pace with population growth, not getting us out of the deep hole of the Great Recession. The amount of GDP that's getting paid out every year in wages and benefits is dropping very, very quickly. And as a result, we're seeing some pretty troubling signs. The number, the percentage of adults who are participating in the workforce is decreasing very quickly. The percentage of kids who are growing up without the benefit of both parents is rising very, very quickly. So we get this impression sometimes that we're living through some really troubling times. And even as technology is racing ahead, it's leaving a lot of people behind. This is an accurate impression. And it's contributing to, I think, a lot of the disenfranchisement we're seeing, a, lot, a broad feeling of disengagement. And it helps me understand everything from the Tea Party on the right to the Occupy movement on the left. Now, we're also seeing a huge range of proposed solutions for these, these ills that we're experiencing these days. Everything from abolishing the Federal Reserve and returning to the gold standard over to leveling absolutely confiscatory taxes on high levels of wealth and income. And again, I want to be clear, I think all these are, fairly, are really, really bad ideas. I don't think they'll be helpful. I don't think they're necessary. What we need to do instead is return to two things that America has historically been super good at, just extraordinarily good at, and these are innovation and inclusion. In other words, coming up with powerful new ideas and then implementing them in a way that brings a lot of people along with us, the, the, a rising tide that floats, if not all the boats, at least most of them. Now, as I tried to illustrate, when it comes to pure tech progress, innovation is just going great guns. We don't have a lot to worry about. But when it comes to some other really important complements to technology innovation, I get a lot more worried. Uh, when it comes to regulations and laws, it feels to me more and more often like we're making choices to protect the status quo, protect incumbents, very often at the expense of innovators and at the expense of consumers. Uh, Larry Lessig has a wonderful way to frame the choice. He says, look, with our laws and our regulations, we can either protect the past from the future or protect the future from the past. Way too often, we're making the first of those choices. My single favorite example, probably, is the fact that in three states and counting, uh, it's actually illegal for any of us to walk into a Tesla dealership and buy the car from that showroom because the existing franchise auto dealers don't want that to happen. We need to tax differently, too. Right now, the US federal government gets about 80% of its revenue from taxes on labor. And for me, the oldest insight of economics is that we need to tax the stuff we want to see less of and subsidize the stuff we want to see more of. It feels to me like we're ignoring that lesson when we levy really pretty stiff additional taxes on employers when they want to bring a new person on or to, that we're putting barriers in place to people when they consider taking a job. We are also putting barriers in the, in the way of entrepreneurs, and these barriers span everything from thickets of regulation to the difficulty of making sure that you've got health care coverage. Our immigration policies right now just make very, very little sense to me. We're putting these Kafka-esque barriers in the place of some of the world's smartest, most ambitious, most talented people who desperately want to come here to build their lives and, and contribute to our economy. And finally, when I look at our educational system and I look at primary education, we used to be the world leader at this. And now it feels to me like we're doing a pretty good job of turning out the employees that we really needed just about a century ago in the era of assembly lines. So we can go down the list of some of the really important things to get right in society, and the innovation is just not there. As a result, I think that's why a lot of people are excluded, are being left behind, and are definitely feeling that way. The, the playbook for what we should do from here is simultaneously really nuanced and really, really complex, and I think also fairly simple. We need to step up our levels of innovation in immigration, education, taxation, policy, regulation, a, a lot of these fairly well understood areas. The economists, my colleagues, have pretty good ideas for what that playbook needs to look like. We need to put it in place. And we need to do it in a way that deliberately tries to bring as many people along with us instead of leaving so many behind like we're doing right now. Thanks very much.